Let's turn to scripture. We're going we're gonna to be in Acts. We're going to continue our series in, in Acts and pick it up at Acts 5. Uh, just a short passage uh, this morning from Acts 5, 12 to 16. The apostles uh, performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought those who were ill into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing those who were ill and those tormented by impure spirits. And all of them were healed. May God add his blessing to his word. I... I, I don't know about you, I've always been a little bit fascinated by shadows. I remember uh, as a young lad, I, would, um, I was the younger one of uh, about 20 cousins, I think, uh, between my both parents on both sides. And uh, there was only a, a couple of other children who were, who were younger than I was. So I was always aspiring to be with the older cousins. And uh, I would, I would, when the sun was out, I would see their shadow and then I would move forward so that my, the top of my shadow but was near the top of their shadow and then just increased slightly and say, I'm bigger than you. I, I remember uh, d- doing that. And I remember maybe you've tried to jump on each other's shadows. You remember playing that game as a child? Or was it just me? I don't know. Um, probably just me. But, uh, and I fondly uh, remember this sequence that I had to share with you from uh, a, a Disney film uh, that's uh, hideously old now and, and outdated. But... but this is just a great scene uh, where Peter Pan is trying to find his lost shadow. I love, the, I love the way that it's the shadow of the, of the stool that trips up Peter Pan's shadow as it's running away there. Genius, genius. Anyway, here we see a shadow with a mind of its own. Uh, and in our passage for today, this shadow of Peter, the apostle Peter, uh, falling on people here that they might be healed, doing amazing things. Shadows. And, and shadows can be good. If it's really hot, they can be a place of shade, a place of relief, a place where we can cool down. Shadows can be ominous, can't they? We can speak about the shadow of a growing threat. Or being in the shadow of someone might prevent someone else from being able to fully uh, fulfill themselves. Or sometimes, uh, after a few dismal days of weather, I'll just uh, celebrate that I can see my shadow. Uh, Because it means that the sun is finally breaking through. And in the Bible as well, shadows can be uh, positive and they can be negative. We, we, we see in the Old Testament, uh, it's speaking of the shadow of Egypt, this growing threat. But the psalmist also speaks about um, being in the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91, many people's favorite, I know. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And then God's love and affection comes through in this idea of a shadow. Keep me as the apple of your eye, it says in Psalm 17, verse 8. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. This place of refuge and, and safety. And in Psalm 36, 57, and then in 63, in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy 
a place where, where the person is free and, and re- re- released from worry that they can praise God and focus on God. Of course, in Psalm 23, we read of the valley of the shadow of death, but we're reminded in the New Testament that, that earthly things are temporal, but spiritual things are eternal. And the, we're reminded in Hebrews 8 verse 5, the tabernacle is described as a shadow of the heavenly glorious presence of God. And in, and in Hebrews 10, the law is described as a shadow of the good things to come. Shadows. Amazing, isn't it? That, that, uh, that someone's shadow could even have this impact. But where does it come uh, in our wider series? Well, let's, let's just do a bit of a uh, review. We've been tracking this community of new believers. Uh, and, and we've been tracking them through these early chapters of Acts as we, we saw in the Ascension when they were still a bit confused. They were waiting and trusting, praying and learning still. Uh, and then in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit has come. They've been receiving uh, the Holy Spirit, preaching, witnessing, explaining and praying to those uh, around them. And then, and then the, we saw that, that beautiful passage at the end of Acts 2 where they're gathered together uh, on a daily basis and growing they're out, out there on the streets of Jerusalem and, and, and the, the, they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, showing love and care for one another, sharing them, performing miracles and healings, learning, worshipping, and praying. And then in chapter 3, we see this amazing healing of, of this man who was lame from birth as Peter's walking through the gates of the temple. Healing, they're worshipping, proclaiming, and witnessing. Uh, the apostles as they're dragged in front of this uh, court and explaining uh, and preaching and praying. And then now more of, of this activity of this new community Proclaiming, witnessing, opposed, um, of opposition from within, uh, and then there's, there's, there's the giving generously, there's uh, miracles and praying again. Here we, here we meet them. So that's been our journey uh, so far. And for us, we, in our journey, can have confidence as we look back in all that God has done. At all that God has done in Scripture, at all that God has done in in the lives of his people here in this country as we look back at the good things that, that God has done through the church and the, and the way that his blessing has flown through the church in the good times. And we can also look back at our own lives at the times when God has been with us. And we can look back and remember those times. The same God who was with us is with us today. And as we saw, there, this has been happening in uh, the sh- uh, growing shadow of, of opposition as well. Uh, there's, there's this sense that something is, is growing that is going to oppose them. They've got this window of opportunity, this window to, to be able to, to reach out. We saw that there, there was sin within the, the community, last week we saw that, and, and then as, as we come through this chapter onto the next chapter, we see the persecution starts from uh, the, re- the religious leaders. There's a growing opposition. But God is shining through. At the end of chapter 2, there's uh, 3,000 believers. By chapter 4, there's 5,000. People are, are encountering Jesus, the risen Jesus and his message and being transformed by him. And for the first time in, in, chap, in chapter 5 and in verse 11 where it says great fear seized the whole church, that church word there is ecclesia and that's the first time that we see this word used about this community. This is where we get the word uh, assembly, it translates, um, so, or church. So it's a, Sometimes an assembly, but when there's an assembly that gathers to try and kick Paul out of uh, Ephesians and, and that the whole town is screaming, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, that's described as an ecclesia. It's a, a general Greek word, but it's normally used and used here uh, as, as the word church. 
So this core group continue to meet every day in the temple's courts. So where, where, where are they? In the, uh, are they as, as they gather in this sheltered place in, in the wings of the temple. Well, it's, it's, there it is on, on, on this, this front side here. Though unfortunately, my, my insert is just blocking slightly. But uh, you can see the, the columns and the colonnade that, that would then be the same on, on this side. Dual columns coming down the east side uh, of, of the temple. Uh, a, a gap of 15 cubits, that's 23 feet wide, and four, with 40 foot tall pillars. Uh, this, this great long colonnade, called Solom- Solomon's Colonnade. Obviously, that's not Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians back in 586 BC. And then another temple was built under the Persians, under Cyrus, with the restoration of the temple in the books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. And then that, that one uh, then is, is removed, and this one is, is rebuilt by Herod. That uh, started in 37 BC. An impressive space. I mean, you, but you'll remember that Jesus encouraged his disciples not to be overawed by the temple. Because actually, it's God's presence is in this group of believers and in their hearts. And if you wanted to find this group of believers, that's where you could go. You could find the way and, and explore what was going on in Jerusalem at this time. And, and as the buzz would have been going around to, to find out what was going on. You will notice as well that uh, it's men and women Luke is, is keen to underline who are coming in uh, to, the, to the presence of, of the Lord, who are, who are believing in the Lord and being added to their number without differentiation with them. Both men and women alike. Uh, Christianity and Jesus were both radically inclusive of women for his day. Radically inclusive. Teaching, teaching women who, who came to him and encouraging them to grow in faith. And something is happening, something amazing is happening in this ecclesia, in this church gathering. And this is celebrated in the Bible, isn't it? The, the, the church is, is something special, it's something quite, quite awesome. The Bible tells us it's something against which the gates of hell shall not prevail. It's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, And in him, the whole building is joined together, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. That's Ephesians 2. It's the body of Christ, each one of you being a part of it in 1 Corinthians 12. And then, uh, I think as James referred to earlier, we like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood and a holy nation, God's special possession, the people of God. The church really is a a, a fantastic theological entity where God is at work today. Are you assembling? Are you being church? I, I appreciate that. I'm preaching to the converted uh, and you're here, which is great. But, but to, to what extent you know, are, are, are we committed to the ecclesia, to the church? You know? to, to what extent are, are we living out our faith in community together? Encouraging one another. Praying with one another. Journeying with one another. There's lots of opportunities to get involved in church life. Um, here at Penrath, you'll, you'll find out about home groups and you'll find out about other activities and things that are going on and, and, and just informal ways that we share life together. And part of our new gathering has been such a privilege just to share with people our journeys together uh, as, and, and to support one another in that. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered, he is there with them. There's something amazing that happens when the people of God gather. 
But for some of them, they don't want to approach back in our passage. For some, they don't want to actually approach uh, this group of apostles for whatever reason. But they are willing to bring the sick and the ill to lie on mats and beds in the hope that Peter's shadow might fall on them. Isn't that odd? It comes across as a little bit superstitious almost, doesn't it, to us? We find ourselves being a little bit sort of looking down on it, really. But isn't this a sign of the grace of God that, that he would work outside the box in such a way? I mean, well, one of these people must have been healed. Uh, otherwise, this story wouldn't be there to encourage others to come along. Uh, it, it does say that uh, there's this hope that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. So often, God works out of the box to reach the downtrodden, to reach the excluded, to reach those on the outskirts. Jesus invited people and accepted people to come to him as they were, as they are. He didn't make barriers for them to come. He invited them to be saved, healed, and transformed. Reconciled to God. And here, even in the shadow of Peter, the power of God is at work. And I can think of times when I've been in the presence of someone and I've thought, wow, the power of God is just exploding out of this person. I just sense God's presence in this person. Maybe you've had the privilege of being with someone like that too. And thought, wow, I can actually sense God's presence. And this person is bringing something of God to me. And in the same way, people reached out, didn't they, to touch the robe of Jesus, just the edge of his cloak. That woman that touched the edge of his cloak, hoping that she might be healed. And God knows the heart. It's not for us to judge. God knows the heart. That may be all that they can manage for the downtrodden for the excluded. God knows the heart. But there's a sense of tragedy here as well because there is so much more available in this core group, in this core community. They're bringing up those who are ill and tormented by impure spirits, we read in 16, and all of them were healed. Isn't that amazing? And yet tragic for those who would stay on the fringe and not come to find out who Jesus really is and what he can really do for them. Who would settle for a physical healing when Jesus wants to bring a spiritual healing and a reconciliation to God. When Jesus wants to bring peace and when Jesus wants to bring eternal salvation by his Holy Spirit into someone's life. In our meeting yesterday, we heard of someone, uh, Simon, as he, as he shared his story, who, who felt that he had to stay in the shadows, stay away, couldn't come into uh, the, the main body of believers because of his same-sex attraction. But as he came into the main body of believers, as he found rela- deeper relationship with Jesus and deeper relationship with the church, his faith has flourished and he has grown. He's found deeper peace and fulfillment as he has seeked to follow scripture. And he spoke of the cost of that yesterday. It was very moving. Um, His humility and and what he's laid down to follow God. Because Jesus brings an amazing freedom, healing and reconciliation as we step out and follow Jesus. That peace with God can come. You'll you'll notice as as well that we, we read that they were tormented by impure spirits, those who'd come in, in our scripture, those who'd come in Jerusalem. We're, we're, we're reminded that the devil ruins lives. Sometimes we just think, 
that, that Jesus is like an optional extra, maybe just to give us a different kind of lifestyle. But no, here, ruined lives are being made whole. People are being set free by, by spirits that are tormenting them. Luke, the physician, uh, traditionally, tells us that they find wholeness and healing in Jesus. And of course, this is a sign that no illness is beyond God. A reminder that in heaven, all of us will be healed. We will all receive complete healing in eternity. Revelation 21 verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. A heavenly future for us to look forward to. Where there is no pain or suffering. Where creation is restored to the perfect world that God created that God designed. And that world is redeemed by Jesus Christ on the cross. And for us today, we can step out into something of the coming kingdom. We see signs of the kingdom breaking through, both in community and in our own lives. There is opportunity We see God at work through his Holy Spirit. We don't see everybody healed. I'm not going to pretend that we do. But God invites us to pray. And sometimes we do see breaking through of the kingdom of God. Even in physical ways, people can be healed. uh, Or people can receive a measure of healing. uh, And in, in emotional ways and in spiritual ways too. And our greatest healing is our salvation. Our greatest healing is that we're reconciled to God. So please do, after the service, if you want to receive prayer, there's the prayer and care corner there. Go there and someone will pray with you. Find peace, find healing, find salvation. Pray that you will receive transformation. Don't sit on a bed waiting for a shadow to pass over you. Step into all that God is calling you into. An eternal relationship with the almighty God as he has made the way open for us by his cross. Amen. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you that you have made a way that we can know you through Jesus Lord, we pause to remember his sacrifice. Lord, we thank you for what he did. Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. I was far away from you and you rescued me. I was unable to turn to you because of my sin. You opened a way for me, you opened my eyes. Thank you, Jesus, that you've saved me. And Lord, I pray that you would come now by your Holy Spirit and bring healing and transformation. Lord, we all have hurts. We all have concerns. And Lord, those might be physical or emotional. They might be spiritual. We come to you and ask you to bring poor healing into our lives through your Holy Spirit. Amen.